So after giving you 10 reasons why we love Android over iOS and iPhone, it's only fair that we examine some of the things that Apple has nailed on their own smartphone series. With that in mind, here are 10 reasons that we think iOS could be potentially considered better than Android. Thanks for watching 95 Google here on YouTube. Remember to thumbs up, hit subscribe, and then tap the bell icon to be among the first to watch our upcoming videos. So one of the best things about buying an Android phone is the undoubted wealth of choice that you have as a prospective buyer. There are hundreds of various form factors and extra functionality courtesy of all of these designs and devices. Almost conversely though, and in some ways a strength of its own, Apple offers only a limited number of smartphone models each and every year, although it is growing with each release. Not only does this make things easier to sell, it's easier to choose or choose between these if you don't quite know what you want or what you need. We're inclined to state that the strength of Android is in its sheer volume of form factors itself and options that you can choose between, but it can be a curse for those who simply don't know what they require for a daily tech companion. A refined product lineup is just easier to market with only one affordable option for you to choose from, the iPhone SE. There's also an entry level flagship, which would account for the iPhone 14 and Plus series, plus there's the Pro models, which are available in regular and Pro Max sizes. Apple has actually released just 34 smartphones that have run iOS since 2007. Samsung actually makes that kind of number of devices in under two years. And it's easy to see that Apple owns and offers one major launch window per year, making it much easier for you to choose from if you are looking for a brand new device. Often people point to the quality of iOS apps over their Android counterparts when we're talking about app system and library. While we'd vehemently contest this, we do know that many developers out there just simply avoid or do prefer developing for iPhone and iPad for whatever reason. The third party app library is certainly more diverse on the App Store when we do start to directly compare to the Google Play Store, but the Play Store is starting to grow in its own right. And it's Simply no, not uncommon to see applications abandoned on the Play Store, but regularly and continually updated over on iOS. This is a great source of frustration for smaller applications out there that many people get kind of garner a cult following for, but even major social media apps like Twitter, for instance, tend to test or add new functionality to iOS first. Then, way down the line, you might get that on, on your Android phone. Personally, you might not care, but it is disappointing when we have to wait for features that iPhone and iPad users are enjoying first, and the apps themselves are going to be key to your smartphone experience. On top of that, when we start to factor in games, which is an app category of its own, most 3D titles just simply perform better on iOS, be that through optimization or even consistency of those updates. Fragmentation has been cited as a reason for development halting on several cross-platform or cross-system applications, including Moments Pro Camera app. That's one of the biggest in recent years over on Android. Financially as well, developing for iOS is just more lucrative, which sadly means that this problem could take a lot longer to address than we would really hope. Over the past 18 months, there's also been a great shift in the Android space with regard to system updates and device updates on the wholesale. If you didn't know, each month Google offers regular bulletin updates that provide patches for known exploits. It's up to Android OEMs to package these software fixes and push them to their respective device lineups. Over on Android, Samsung leads the way by providing flagship phones like the Galaxy S22 series and likely the upcoming S23 series with five years of regular support. And this includes four full Android system updates and five full years of regular monthly security patches on top of that. Google's own update promise for the Pixel lineup, of course those running Tensor chipsets, only offers three operating updates or operating system updates, but matches that five years of regular monthly patches. That's certainly impressive for Android, but it pales in comparison to Apple's own iOS update promises. While there are actually no concrete plans, you'll likely get updates for the better part of a decade, no matter which handset you do choose or even hold onto. To put this to an even wider context, the iPhone 6S was still receiving updates up to iOS 15 last year. A six year old device ran the latest OS while the Galaxy S7, released in the same year, ceased receiving OS updates back in 2018. That said, to Samsung's credit, the Korean firm did push regular security patches up until March 2020, with one last update back in October 2020. But that said, currently the iPhone 8 series is still actively supported supported by Apple, and that was released back in 2017. Genuinely, no Android phone released back in 2017 is officially supported by an OEM. 
There are a few exceptions on Android, such as the Fairphone series, but for software and therefore device longevity, Apple certainly reigns supreme. Functions like AirDrop and HandOff help create cohesion between your smartphone and other devices like the iPad or a Mac computer without any other software requirements. And it's one thing we're slightly jealous of here over on Android. Google is working hard to offer alternatives like the pretty excellent nearby share and even Chrome itself, the browser, offers the ability to pick up right where you left off. These themselves are great, but do lack that seamless consistency that you'll get if you own multiple Apple devices. It's not even limited to browser windows over on iOS as you can almost ditch your phone entirely when using a Mac for things such as calls, selective Bluetooth accessories, messaging, and even in-app content will be available across hardware without needing a wire. This is kind of like the Chromebook or Chrome OS approach and that cloud storage that they use, but slightly on steroids. The downside here though is that if you heavily rely on one outside system or one outside application, the experience can break given the Apple only service requirement. That said, there really are some benefits to a walled garden approach to tight software and hardware design. And this is something that we think the Pixel lineup could and potentially should mimic to great effect later down the line. At present, not a single processor utilized by a flagship level Android phone is actually able to match Apple's A16 Bionic processor. The raw performance metrics are so heavily in favor of this internally developed chip that it's almost unfair to compare Qualcomm, MediaTek, and even Google's own chipsets to Apple's processor efforts. We've seen the gap close in recent years, obviously to our own benefit, but the attempts at a real world speed test do show that Apple's processor definitely bests the competition still to this day. Alongside the most powerful processor, on-device memory management is also one of the core tenets of how iOS offers so much speed, but it does so with almost half the RAM allowance at 6GB of LPDDR5 RAM versus some of the best Android flagships which offer 12 and above. We can only hope that in time Android will finally catch up and maybe even surpass the unmatched power of Apple's A-series chips. It's really hard to argue when people do go out there and complain about third-party bloatware on many Android phones that you might purchase. Although Google does offer bloat-free Pixel phones, even Samsung is slightly guilty of adding apps and services that you might never use. Some of the biggest culprits are certainly the Chinese OEMs like Xiaomi and Oppo. Carrier lock devices even come with some apps pre-installed on specific Android phones in regions out there too. On the iPhone though, like on the Pixel series, it's devoid of any third-party bloatware right out of the box. Sure, you could be well within your rights to claim that many of Apple's own iOS apps are a little bit intrusive, but at least there's no Facebook, Amazon, or Netflix pre-installed when you set up for the first time, like you'll spot on many Android phones out there. You could also make that argument that these can be uninstalled right away. However, in the case of Android OEMs like OnePlus, you might even have services like Alexa baked into the OS, which begs the question, where do bloatware apps and services end and system resources begin? If you care about bloatware, you might want to look to iOS because they have done a great job over on the Apple side of things by reducing this and not being strong armed into installing lots of applications that you might never ever use. So while we have a plethora of Android phones that you could consider a battery beast, we have to say iOS definitely reigns supreme right at the top end of the smartphone market. Whether it's standby time or even when in use, Apple's power management, even with smaller internal cells, sometimes half the size compared to the best Android flagships, is truly impressive to behold. Although technically discontinued via official channels, the iPhone 13 Pro Max from 2021 is still one of the longest lasting devices that you can go out and buy today, obviously through non-official and certain channels out there. This is going to be a testament to both Apple's internal chipset and software teams for making something that cohesively works for so long without inhibiting any of your user functions. And we would love to see exceptional standby time on more Android phones out there, although some of them are getting closer. After all, iOS still seems to pip everyone else to the post in this one. The wealth of accessories that you can pick up for the iPhone or even the most high profile Android phones is almost another no contest. 
Apple's own first party accessories, they're pretty solid, but it's the sheer volume of similarly high quality third party options from practically every brand that you can think of out there absolutely obliterate most of the alternatives for the best Android phones. Most of this, of course, is driven by the potential profit margins for these firms, but recent functions like MagSafe show that even common accessories like charge cables and cases can level up with simple changes. A quick glance at any online marketplace that sells smartphone accessories also shows you just how much more choice there is for iPhone owners out there. And it's certainly an unfair comparison, but something that likely won't change unless one brand dominates Android in a similar manner. It is disappointing to see that Samsung might sell more units globally, but the accessory lineup for the latest Galaxy phone certainly pales in comparison to a top tier iPhone. If you want accessories, there are certainly way more for the iPhone out there. Another contentious inclusion that we've kept in this video is Apple's hardware design choices. Of course, as we all know, personal preference is still gonna be a key component. And while it's certainly true that not all iPhones or specific portions of the iPhone look particularly attractive, we have to say that the design is a little bit more consistent, especially when Apple makes a change, as the firm themselves just doubles down and owns those changes that they make. We often see numerous Android OEMs even bend their own hardware to look similar or just flat out copy the iPhone lineup, and it's something we wanna see a lot less of. One thing we do really like is the restoration of flat displays to their flagship phone lineups, and it's one such design trait that we can certainly agree with and one we want more Android OEMs to get behind. Curved phones may be nice to hold and visually look at, but that doesn't always translate to improved usability. Apple also tends not to scrimp or cheap out on the iPhone lineup, especially when it comes to the internals and the external chassis changes. Even if downgrades are made, the best possible components tend to be used. A great example would be the LCD screens on the iPhone XR and the iPhone 11. Although they weren't quite or were a little bit below 1080p, they were exceptional LCD panels tuned to perfection. You can also equally make the claim that the iPhone design itself is pretty staid or unambitious, at least over the last few years, when compared to the likes of Samsung, OnePlus, Oppo and Xiaomi, who offer a multitude of form factors with various devices. But overall, we have to say that Apple's design is impressive in its own right. While certainly a huge cop out on our part, which is why we actually have saved this for last, Apple's excellent but closed messaging system is almost synonymous with instant messaging in many regions around the globe. Yes, we're talking about iMessage, and although it's almost always a US specific complaint because iMessage itself is baked directly into the SMS and messaging application, it certainly gives the iPhone a distinct advantage over most Android phones, especially if people are not using the basic or the built-in SMS application. Sure, we have excellent third-party and cross-platform messaging options that offer much of the same functionality as iMessage, but if you're in North America, getting friends and family to switch is often a nightmare, as I've heard multiple times from friends and colleagues. There is a reason why this is one of the few services that Apple will likely never make available for cross-platform, and it's because of that locking to the system. The feature set is also pretty impressive in its own right too, with things like read receipts, typing indicators, direct payments that you can make through the messaging application. There's also the ability to send high quality video and images right from the messenger itself. There's even playable games with one-to-one -one or even group chats out there. And that is just the tip of the iceberg too. Of course, the rich communication services standard does allow for many similar features within supported applications like Google Messages on Android phones. And not only though, these are incompatible with iMessage itself, despite Google's best efforts with the high profile get the message campaign. The fact that iMessage itself just works without needing to think about it or even use another service is why we obviously hear that iPhone users are so reliant on the platform. But overall, we have to give kudos to Apple for making such an excellent service. It's been around for around 11 years now and it only gets better every year. So there are numerous things that we can think Android can learn from iOS, but what are your thoughts? Where do you think iOS and the iPhone surpass Android? Let us know down in the comment sections below, but let's be civil. It's okay to be a fan of one side, but we're all friends here. Hopefully though, you enjoyed this look inside Apple's walled garden, so to speak. But until next time, this is Damien with 95 Google saying thanks for watching, and I will chat to you later.